This morning's entry is going to be a little different. I'm going to take a trip down memory lane, which is to say this current life and not necessarily just my past life, although I will bring in some parallels just as they come in. Back in 1986, something like that, I developed a serious interest in photography. I just took to it immediately. I had tried to learn jazz piano. I was taking lessons, but I just didn't have the knack for it. And then I found an Instamatic in a garage sale, a yard sale, and went out and realized I just had the eye. You know, it was just automatic with me. And uh, I'll put up on the screen a uh, black and white rendition of one of my very first photographs. This is like from my second roll of film when I had no idea of the technical aspects of what I was doing. I was down in Miami at a place where my father used to play tennis in Coconut Grove. And uh, the park there has some banyan trees. So I took this shot. So in uh, 1986, I uh, realized that I was a photographer, just kind of born to it. And I bought a camera and I went out and I started shooting and I just fell in love with it. So uh, about 1989 or 1990, a friend of mine lent me his video camera and it opened up a whole new world for me. I realized that now this is photography, but now I can add sound and uh, time and I uh, started really getting into that. I, I took, well, I think I'll put up on the screen here if I can find it, some one or two shots I took when I had my photography tripod, which doesn't have a fluid head, which means that I couldn't do pans, but I still managed to get some artistic shots. I wanted to get some training because in photography, of course, I have no money. I didn't have money then. I don't have it now. So everything has to be done on the cheap, see? So uh, in photography, I joined a club, the Alpine Camera Club in Atlanta, and they have contests. And whenever you enter a contest, you'll get a free critique on your piece from people who are knowledgeable. So I picked up an education on photography that way. This, of course, is absolutely parallel with Matthew Franklin Whittier because he was self-educated and picked up his education wherever he could find it. So uh, when I got into video, I wanted to do the same thing. And the way to do that was to join with the Community Access Television. There was one in DeKalb, Georgia, near Atlanta. So I joined up with them. And what you do with them, this is way before YouTube and the internet, when everybody had a cell phone that took pictures and everybody could edit it and so on. Back then, you know, not too many people could. So you got to use this television equipment and editing equipment, and you created your own television show. It was all free. And I remember that I did this for almost a year. And at some point, I realized, you know, I don't actually have a job. <laughs> you, know, you, you start thinking that this volunteer thing is a job, see, and it isn't. But anyway, I created a show called Universal Language. And it was a music show. Of course, it had a philosophical background. I was trying to do a one-world emphasis. And I would find artists in the Atlanta area from other cultures. And my original idea was uh, I was a purist and I wanted the, the pure representation of that culture. And always I got people who had some admixture, some Western elements in it, you know. Um, and at first that bothered me. And then I said, no, this works. You know, this actually is better. For example, I uh, videotaped uh, some African drummers, but a whole bunch of them were white, you know. <laughs> but I mean, this it helped actually to bring people together. So there's times when either higher guidance or serendipity or something puts together something better and higher than what you had in initially intended, you know. So at some point I started doing this and of course it was pretty rough. I had to beg and borrow, you know, to get animation, for example, which you'll see the opening animation of my show is a little bit crooked, you know, well, that's the way the guy created it for me, I guess. Um, and, you know, the cameras were not top notch, especially when I went out in the field and used my own cameras, you know, they were not that great. But you can see the concepts that I had the concepts and I, I did pretty well. So I'm going to give some examples of that. 
one of them is an Indian group named Sangeet Kar, which is still in existence. Some of the guys are still around and they're still playing with that group. Um, and then there was another one. There was a young couple named Jem and Ariane Moore. Actually, I don't think they were married at that time. They were free spirits. And I first encountered them at a Renaissance festival. They would dress up and they would play this, you know, music from past eras with kind of improvisation worked into it. And uh, there was a spirit about them. There was some high vibe that they were conveying, you know, that, that drew me in. I photographed them, but then I uh, videotaped them in concert. They were in concert in, it was a Unitarian church in Atlanta. And uh, it was the, the first field shoot like that that I had directed directing as a talent in and of itself. And I actually had a talent for it. So I was directing and directing means that you choose which camera shots to dissolve in and so on. It's actually, nobody notices it, but it's quite a skill in its own right. Well, one of the cameras broke down. So instead of three cameras, I only had two. So what I did was I positioned one in the balcony and that one could either take the wide shot, the establishing shot, or it could zoom in from that angle. And then I had somebody down on the floor with a handheld camera. So between the two, there's quite a bit of variety, and you'll see that. I'm going to give an example of that. But finally, oh, and I wanted to mention that uh, in a particular sense, Matthew did something very similar because he used to report on lyceum talks, on speeches, and he would try to take a talk, like an anti-slavery talk or some other high-minded uh, topic, which only reached, say, 50 or 60 people, or however many filled the room, and expand the reach of that talk out to the entire community. Well, in this case, with Jim and Ann, Arianne Moore, I was doing exactly the same thing because they were touching the lives of maybe 50 people in the auditorium, but I was extending their reach out to the entire Atlanta community, meaning the entire Atlanta community that watched Community Access TV, which is relatively small. So I'm going to show that. And then finally, the call went out for all of the producers, which they gave us that grandiose title of producer, that we would uh, create a skit if we'd like to, and it would be combined somehow. Well, I jumped on that and I created a skit about Einstein being unemployed and going to the unemployment office and trying to get a job. And, you know, Einstein, there was a lot of things he wasn't really all that good at, like typing and simple math and stuff. So what I did was I knew a physicist and I asked her to kind of encapsulate for me what Einstein's theory was concerning um See, I can't even formulate it now because I don't really know physics at all. But it had to do with the theory of gravitation and so forth. So she gave me an encapsulation of his theory, and I put that in the actor's mouth. Well, the reason I came up with this idea for a skit was that I was going around to garage sales and yard sales looking for items that would fit on my set because I had a little set that I would put up in the studio, and then I would go out and do field shoots. So I needed, you know, windows and chairs and various things. Well, I found a window frame at this garage sale, and who should be selling it but Einstein? You know, I mean, the, the guy really made me think of Einstein. He even had, like, the German heritage and everything in the accent. So his name, as I recall, was Mort Liebman, and he was a retired microphone salesman. He had had a stroke, but he, you know, if he kind of thought carefully, he could still deliver lines, and he was quite amenable to playing Einstein in the skit, see? So I brought him in. He did a beautiful job. He was fantastic. And then there was another young woman I knew who was an aspiring actress, and uh, she was kind of a beautiful Latin fiery character. So I gave her the name of Gloria Decker and gave her the role of the counselor, see? And then some of the other people were my friends, including the fellow who had loaned me the video camera. He shows up in there. So um, I put together this skit. I don't know if it ever aired, to be perfectly honest. But the gist of it is that speaking through Einstein symbolically, I'm expressing my frustration that I really should be teaching a class in literature or philosophy. You know, I really should be a lecturer, an author and a lecturer, and should be able to easily support myself that way. And I'm blocked from that, I would say, because I'm too far ahead of my time and because of societal ignorance and the recalcitrance of the status quo. It's not fair. It may be 
expect expected, you know, what you could expect, but it's not fair by any means. Therefore, and this is how I got to this whole thing, I'm forced to apply for jobs that I'm really not suited for, you know, all my life because I've been ignored for what I actually am good at. I'm forced to do things that the people who are teaching classes in philosophy and literature should be doing, in my opinion. You know, uh, I have to do their jobs since they have unfairly taken the job that I should be doing. So anyway, that's kind of the parallel. Matthew was in exactly the same situation. He really should have been editing a paper. He really should have been teaching classes. He really should have been giving talks. He really should have been a celebrated author, but he found himself having to do bookkeeping and reporting, you know, and things of that nature. Well, so the same frustrations, karma doesn't jump that much from one lifetime to another. It's the same themes that show up in slightly different situations. See? Um, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and show these videos and make a little commentary before each one. But I did want to mention the funniest skit that I ever saw there or maybe anywhere else. It's so edgy, it can't be shown even today on YouTube. <laughs> okay, So there was a guy named Doug. I don't remember his last name, but he was one of the staff. There was a handful of staff, and his job was to run the shows in the control room. And I was just hanging around, and I noticed a bunch of people standing in the control room, all standing around watching this video that Doug was playing, that he had made, see? And nobody knew what it was, except every once in a while you could see the light bulb went off and somebody like started to snicker because they realized what it was, see? Well, it was a puppet. And it had, if I remember correctly, it had little popsicle arms and legs, you know, and a little mouth and googly eyes, you know, the kind that you stick on that, that move around, right? And it was, the voice was George Bush, the first George Bush, giving a speech about the Gulf War and Desert Storm. And I do particularly remember the line, we must take a firm, erect stance, see? And then it hit me, that's Doug's penis. <laughs> With the whole group of your eyes turned into a puppet, see? And, and like you said, you, like I said, you could see, you know, different people catch on to what it was, you know, one, two, three, four. <laughs> it aired, and he didn't get fired. I think he got a little bit of a reprimand, you know. <laughs> he was still working there. So that was Community Access TV. Um, however, let's see. So what shall I show first? I'll, the first thing I'll show you is Sangi Car. This is gives you an idea what my set looked like. Again, everything's done on the cheap. Um, but, uh, these guys came in and, uh, one of them is passed on, uh, Rafi, the, uh, fellow that has the, I don't know what you call it, an oud, I think he's playing, uh, he's passed on some years ago, but several of the guys are still with us. And, uh, this will just give you some idea of what it looked like in the studio. <laughs> All right, the next is Jem and Ariane, and uh, again, I found them at the Renaissance Festival and then uh, went ahead and videotaped them in their concert, and at this point, I had brought in a host, and this fellow, he was a South American free spirit artist, and uh, in hindsight, it probably would have been better not to get mixed up with this fellow. Um, I don't want to say anything, you know, too harsh, but I just think it wasn't really a, a match, you know. Uh, and this is typical of Matthew Franklin Whittier, that he would partner with the wrong people, with people who were iconoclasts, and he related to them on that level, but maybe they didn't have their shit together quite as much as they should have, and they weren't really a good influence. So I did it again as Stephen Sacalarius. But um, nonetheless, what I'm going to show you here, this is with, you know, very cheap cameras, but I'm going to show you the interview, the tail end of the interview, and then uh, let that run into the beginning of the show. 
And then I'm going to skip to another song that they play that uh, I think is particularly stirring. It's a very high vibe these guys used to uh, put out. There's no question about it. What happens with the traditionalists that want to hear just traditional music? What What's their reaction? Do they completely get turned off? Do some of them have enough patience to appreciate what you are for what you are? What's, most of, what's that, man? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, too. And uh, most of the time, they really appreciate what we're doing, and it's, and it's obvious that we're not trying to recreate a traditional piece in its traditional style. And so w once they realize that that's not what to expect, um, what we do with the music seems to be very enjoyable to them. Um, and it, it's never been our goal to try and recreate you know, traditional music in traditional styles. We're, we're taking what we have and moving forward with it. And um, so far, no, nobody has really um, been put off by what we're doing with it, as far as I know, but they may not be telling us. Mm -hmm. but, um, so did jazz ever come back? Or was jazz just part of the past and forgotten? No, it, uh, it shows up in what we do arrangement-wise. Jazz, of course, is, is its body and soul is improvisation over a set chord pattern or, or phrase or whatever. And what we do is in the midst of a traditional Irish piece, instead of playing the whole piece through exactly the same every time with min minor little melody variations, what we'll do is play it through a time or two and then have an entire time through the song <coughs> that's devoted to improvisation. And I'll take off and, and do a, a jazz solo on Hammer Dulcimer. And uh, when we recorded this last album, the guy we brought in as a bass player to play on a couple of tunes, uh, he played acoustic upright bass, and he was, he's a really well-known jazz bass player. And so you get this really great energy that came out of, out of improvising with the, the bass lines going on, and the dulcimers improvising on a lick, and, and the whole thing weaves out, and it's, it's like watching a flock of birds that are all flying this way, and all of a sudden the whole flock changes and switches that way. You know, the, you feel that same energy in the music, where it's something brand new, but still together, changing back and forth. And to me, that's the really exciting part of jazz, and that's the really, that's the the heart that we brought into our music from jazz. It's got magic fingers, this chair. <laughs>
quarter in my ear. <laughs> So now, last but not least, I want to show you the skit with Einstein. I'm going to play the whole thing. It's about six minutes. It's not a, a side-splitting, you know, roll-on-the-floor funny thing. It's thoughtful and it's amusing, I would say. But it's an interesting parallel because this is 1990, and this is like 30 years ago, 31 years ago, and it's 25 years before I knew anything about Matthew Franklin Whittier. I had no idea that I had been a humorist in a past life and a humorist who used his humor to convey philosophy, you know, more deeply philosophical ideas and metaphors and so on. So I'm repeating my history as Matthew without having any idea who he was. So uh, without further ado, here is Einstein at the unemployment office. The rules require you to apply for two jobs per week. You didn't apply for that second job. It's as simple as that. I didn't apply for the job because it only pays $6 an hour. I can't feed a family of four on $6 an hour. I still qualify for food stamps. Well, you can't expect to start at the top now, can you? But if I accept this job, I'll lose all my benefits. And this job just won't pay the bills. What am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? Well, maybe you really don't want to work, is that it? Take this to line D. Shouldn't take very long. Mr. Einstein, please. Mr. Albert Einstein? Are da, you Mr. Einstein? Da, that's me. Sorry I keep you waiting. Did you... 
daydreaming like that, were we? That's not going to help us with our job search now, will it? Did you bring your list of job contacts? That's not it. Ah, here it is. Here it is. <clears throat> so, we lost three jobs this week, Mr. Einstein. I wonder about that, too. I can't figure it out. Well, let's see. Tuesday, fired from electronics assembly job. No, not fired exactly. I was let go for lack of work. Lack of work? I've been placing applicants in that position for the past 15 years. They haven't run out of work yet. You see, after an hour, I realized the part of this installing wasn't really necessary. It only took a small modification to eliminate it all together. Save the company money. That's how they show their appreciation. Okay. What happened here on Wednesday? Fired for insubordination is what they said. No, no, that's not it at all. If I had mixed those chemicals like he told me to, it would have blown the place sky high, kaboom. Okay, well, what about this third job as janitor at the elementary school? It says right here, excessive socializing and failure to perform duties assigned. Well, what about that one? I was mopping the cafeteria mm -hmm. when fell into conversation with one of their cooks. She was a very smart cookie indeed. Pretty too. <laughs> and. She posed an interesting philosophical question, and I suppose we lost track of time. I guess I'm not good with this kind of work. Mr. Einstein, um, what exactly are you good at? <laughs> um, can you type? Not very well, I'm afraid. Ah, uh, well, how about uh, simple mathematics? No longer much good with that either. Um, what exactly is it that you used to do, Mr. Einstein? Ich bin theoretical physicist. What exactly does someone in that capacity actually uh, do? I formulate theories about the structure and nature of the universe. The universe? Yeah, the gods of Megilla. The, the what? That means the whole thing, everything. Oh. You see, it is known that the force of gravity and the electromagnetic force both behave very similarly. Because of this, I have theorized that the origin of these two forces must be the same. Hmm. However, while these forces act in much the same manner, there is a great difference in relative magnitude. If, for example, you could isolate two electrons, the electromagnetic force between them will be 10 to the 42nd power greater than the force of gravity. Wow. A very huge difference. I cannot, in my theory, account for such a great disparity between these two forces. Hmm. Um, you know, Mr. Einstein, I myself don't really know about, you know, these kind of things, but it sounds to me like uh, you're talking about describing uh, what happens between our state department head and the department chairman. I mean, both are 
doing pretty much the same kind of work, but um, they're operating at, well, different, you know, levels of administration, you know, with one being considerably more powerful than the other, of course. And different levels. Different levels. Yeah. Yeah. That could be it. Yeah. Uh, that could be it. Uh, Mr. Einstein. Oh. Uh, Doctor, thank you, Miss Decker. You have been a tremendous, huge, humongous help. Ah, uh, thank you.